Austin Flowers, one of the my uh, dear, dear friends, known this young man here when he was really young before he had all that facia hair. What's up, brother? How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? You must love me because of all the scheduling options I gave you, you chose nine o'clock and you know my bedtime is 8.30, right? I do. I do. It was more of a test than anything. <laughs> well, I don't know if anyone knows, for those of you guys listening that knows me, uh, you guys know I've been martial arts for a long time. I got to know Austin when he was a little butthead coming into my uh, Taekwondo school and I believe I gave you your first lesson. Correct. You did. You did. And somehow along the way, we couldn't get rid of you. You got your black belt. And then later in life, you uh, discovered and found the love for jujitsu, which you uh, recently over the last couple of years also got your black belt, huh? That's right. Yeah. Almost two years ago. Well, stop showing off, man. Toast to that. Cheers. Cheers. Is that apple juice? What is that? No, it's a little bourbon cocktail. I don't want to say the name because it's a little infeminate. Well, I will I will say my, my normal whiskey of choice is um, Buffalo Trace. I'm going light right now with a little bit of uh, Winter Jack, some leftover whiskey. Because I don't want to get a little bit too savage on this podcast. But uh, hey, man, how have you been? I've been really well. Been really well. Yeah. You look good, dude. You look good. Thank you. Nice Thank and trim and in shape? Or is that just the angle? You know what? It's um, it's just it's just a, a starved father is what it is. It's not exercise. It's not nutrition. Dude, father of two. Dax and Ryan, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. Dax is how old now? Dax is three years old. Just turned okay. three. And Ryan, Ryan is? Ryan is eight months today. And Ryan is a female for those who are not, you know, trendy with the, you know, uh, dual sex names of a, of a son and a daughter. Good for you. Now I will repeat this to Morgan, but are you done? You know what we were at? We've been going back and forth. We, uh -huh. I, I come from, as you know, a family with three siblings. There's four of us and we have a large extended connected family. Mm -hmm. We've always talked about doing the same, having several kids. You know, having a son and then a daughter kind of yeah. in the back of both worlds mm -hmm. makes you can guess it. But when you look 20, 30 years in the future and you're, you know, middle aged, an older person, easy. I, I like the idea of having a, yeah, sorry. I like the idea of having a larger family. So I, I think we're down for number three. All right. When you say we, you're talking about you and Morgan, right? The unit's just speaking for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm not sabotaging your birth control or anything like that. We're both on board. <laughs> yeah, well, good, man. Good. I, well, I, I know you and I know your character. You know, I don't want this to be a, a blow up, a, a smoke up your skirt fest, but uh, you're one of the guys I respect the most and you're, you're an amazing father without a doubt. So yeah, the more the merrier, man. Good for you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, so uh, when, what year, what year you, did you get your, your jiu-jitsu black belt? Uh, 2021? 20, 20, okay. 2021. Okay. Uh, a lot of people know exactly dates year well, years i know but there's people who know every specific day where they were white to blue belt to uh -huh. belt, to belt et cetera. i just remember it was the spring of 2021 i think it was may um it was after a, a competition and um so that's kind of how i'm trying to remember engaging it but i think maybe april of 21 so so dax was around the radio right but he was a baby yeah dax was uh was just over one yeah, he was at the the ceremony, if you will. Right, right. Yeah. He... So, so I guess where I'm going with that is that's when you had a, a newborn. You know, probably he was just a tag along everywhere. Now you have a second. And now he's a toddler, so I'm sure he's running around and stuff like that. Did you still have the energy to to practice, to roll, and, uh, and do all that good stuff as well? I have less energy, mm -hmm. but do I have the energy to roll? I I, I go and I roll. Do I have as much energy as I ever want? No, but your love for it's still there, right? Exactly. Yeah, it's a passion. It's um, you know, martial arts being fostered by people like you mm. it's, it's a lifelong passion of mine. It's now a critical part of my life. I don't think I would be, uh, you know, sane if yeah. I did not if I didn't have a, a physical outlet. There's something, you know, there's something primordial about a combat sport and i think oh, yeah. it's very important not to permit, but all human beings to experience that part of their psyche yeah what what do you think it is because obviously you were you were a dedicated taekwondo practitioner you got your black belt the art's totally different but what i always say you know with with jujitsu there's something unique about it that it actually kind of calls to to people so why did it call to you 
it's so much more of a journey for me than than my taekwondo experience yeah. and you know for lack of a better term i don't a career mm -hmm. uh taekwondo journey you know i i started when i was 12 years old 11 years old my little brother started and i remember my mom telling me and him in the car or telling me in the car yeah, your little brother started uh, at the time he called it karate which is now a, a forsaken term to be used yeah when referring to my taekwondo black belt but i i didn't like the idea of my little brother doing a sport and me not doing it too i thought i right. ah, can't let my little brother beat me up one day so i started i i really enjoyed it one of my childhood friends from football actually went to the same academy and I, I loved it. I loved the sparring aspect of it. Uh, things like forms are a big thing in Taekwondo and that, mm. that, that never, that never sang to me, mm. but having a few role models that I really enjoyed being around and that I could learn from helped me really embrace the art. To me, my black belt meant everything. I felt like I, I still do felt like I earned it, felt like my, mm. you know, I was so dedicated, so passionate about the art, but. I just, I, I just questioned it to be honest. And at the same time in the, in the Taekwondo Academy, there was a, an old man named Gustavo who had a crew of about six people who a few times a week would, they'd take, get themselves on the edge of the map and they would, they would trade Jiu Jitsu. Mm -hmm. And then this guy who I, I still know today, um, who walked, who came in in a wheelchair and he put on these wrestling shoes that at the time I thought were tied together. Uh, he has spina bifida and I remember watching him train jujitsu mm -hmm. and beat up guys who were able-bodied and really athletic, really impressive. And he would just tie their way with them. And I remember thinking, man, that's really interesting. Yeah. And at the same time, you and Kyle, uh, another family friend of both you and I introduced me to the UFC and BJ Penn and Chuck Liddell, you know, that was the the era of the UFC, I feel like, and I just became obsessed with it. Um, fast forward, I was playing football at the time, high school football, really dedicated football program in my high school. So no time for anything and really basically right after college is when I started jujitsu. So I took, I took some time off of martial arts in general for uh, my education. I was working full time, going to school at night. And that's when I started jujitsu was right after that. So in your, in your journey, what do you correlate that to in terms of, uh, is it more an emotional challenge, a physical challenge, a mental challenge? I know it's all, all three, but if you had to rate for you, what was, what were the tough, toughest days? Was it the days when you were just, gosh, I can't get a technique because I intellectually can't grasp it. Or was it emotional because your ego is just keep getting tapped or is it physical, physical because it's so strenuous because those three marks, I'm going somewhere with this question for you. If you had to rate him, what was the most challenging for you? Uh, um, bar none mental. Okay. Uh, the, the, the physicality portion of it, you know, playing football since I was eight years old and being part of very serious programs where, you know, that's two or three a day practices in high school. It prepared me for the, for the physical aspect of it. Mm -hmm. For, and I still don't consider myself an athlete. I can't catch or throw, a, uh, any sort of ball. Uh, I'm not that fast. Um, so the, the, it was, it, sorry, the, it was the mental part. Um, to this day, I, I still have, I still, I still battle the ego. Um, you know, as a, as a black belt in a very competitive gym, I train with killers. Sure. Some of these been training for <clears throat> three, four, five years compared to my, my 10 years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're not, if you're not completely on your game you're you're gonna get caught and yeah. weak-minded as it may sound it's still it's still not something that i'm okay with yeah and um really the ego defeating my ego which has become a, a, a bigger theme of my life in general mm -hmm. that's the most challenging part um you know my my jiu-jitsu journey was was interesting i i trained under a certain individual for most of my jiu-jitsu career up until mm -hmm. I was a brown belt and for a variety of reasons I I left that gym I went to a gym that opened up right when COVID happened and it was the literally one of the best decisions of my entire life mm -hmm. uh, I'm 
repping the repping the academy shirt right now. Yeah. Uh, so I, I mean, I remember when I switched academies, and I'm sitting in the parking lot as a brown belt, and my heart is beating out of my chest. Um, you know, just anxious to go into this new environment. Mm -hmm. And that happened for two, three months, just every single night. I mean, I train five days a week on average. So yeah. every single time I'm sitting in that parking lot for 15 minutes, just heart beating out of my chest. And, you know, it's all about just uh, really the ego. Yeah. Yeah. But you know what that is? Isn't that this part of it that is, is not part of it? I think a lot of it is super cool because I don't think a lot of people as they, you know, evolved or kind of, I don't even want to say the word evolved, kind of just fall into life. They lose that excitement. They lose that sense of fear. They lose that sense of, ooh, you know, something's at stake, something's on the line, right? Mm -hmm. And when you train and you roll and you spar and you go in, especially with a gym where, you know, you have professional competitors, both in MMA and, and Jiu-Jitsu, you, like you say, you got to be on your A game. I think a lot of people in life in general fall into life and they don't ever get to be in the A game because everything is running on default or on status quo. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And I, I think that's one thing that's beautiful about martial arts and jujitsu in, in particular is that in any given day, man, no matter how good you are, if you're running on default and you're just running on status quo, you learn real quick because you're going to be strangled, right? Exactly. And I do, I do love it. And I, I do enjoy the aspect of it too. And I think on a broader scale, you bring that into, you know, a life environment. I think it's super important. So you think that grounds you in, in overall and everything you do? Cause, cause I know what you do for a living. Obviously you have a high pressure job. A, a lot of uh, people depend on you. You have a lot of major accounts. Um, you have a lot of staff and, and, and employees that look up to you, et cetera, et cetera. And also you have your family that comes first. So for you to be the best Austin, do you find that jujitsu itself has helped you maintain that anchor? Absolutely. It's, it's helped me stay in shape. It's helped me stay sane. It's helped me be a better father. Um, yeah, it's, it's a core part of my life and I would not be the person who I am today for better or worse without jujitsu. It, it's my therapy. Um, I, I would go, I would go crazy with it. I, I don't think I would be, I, I would consider myself a nice person, but I don't think I would be as friendly of a person if I didn't have an outlet like jujitsu or a combat yeah. sport. Is that, is that weird? You brought up a very good point. For those that, that haven't trained or walked into a legitimate MMA school or, or gym or what have you, what is the what is the the default assumption that most people have about fighters or people that, that train? That they're probably assholes or they're punks or they're bullies or whatever, right? Probably first things from the truth, right? Because I think yep. your, your ego gets in check all the time when you train. And that, that, that energy that's built up kind of just gets exhausted. So that's why I think people are super friendly when you go into a gym and most gyms, unless there's, you know, there's always outliers out there. And I can tell you a unique story one time when I trained at tours in a little bit, but for the most part, man, it's handshakes and hugs, right? It's, it's exactly handshakes and hugs in the middle of strangling you, you know, strangling you I, to death. But uh, when you're sitting there and you are a, a D1 athlete or you're a bodybuilder and you go in there mm -hmm. and you uh, a spectacle wearing freckled teenager who, uh, who, who looks like an introvert sitting on the edge of the mat. And then you go and roll with him and he puts you to sleep. It's really easy to, to put your ego in check. Oh yeah. Well, shoot. Who is that? Who's that kid? Mike, I can remember his last name. He's over in uh one cause one does jujitsu tournaments as well too. Skiing funny kid. Huh? Mikey Musumeshi. Yes. Yeah. You describe exactly who I was thinking about. Um, and, and for you guys that are listening, look him up. He's probably, probably top five, maybe in the world right now, strang on people, knee yeah. arm people. And the kid is probably what, I don't know what weight class is, but he's, he's just this thin glasses wearing kid that you would never expect. It's like, Hey, give me your milk money. Any kind of kid until, you know, he strangles you and you black out and you wake up on the ground, that kind of deal. And I, I do love that. I do love that, the aspect of martial arts. And I think that's one thing that's beautiful about jujitsu too, is, is that, it does what martial arts in theory should have been doing, which is giving the quote unquote weaker guy, quote unquote smaller guy, the opportunity to defend himself against a bigger opponent. Right. And it's, it's one that's proven to work, man. But yeah, check him out, man. He's, he's awesome.
I'll, I'll look him up and I'll tag him on this description too, so people can check him out. The dude is awesome. He actually reminds me a lot of you, not not because he's a nerd or anything like that, but just because the way he's built lanky. Because you're, you know, what do you think your strong points are physiology wise, as far as you know your your body structure? What what makes your moves kind of unique? You think? My flexibility. I have natural flexibility that mm. is a key part of my game. I say natural flexibility, but having trained Taekwondo starting in eleven and stretching being a huge aspect of, of, you know, my, mar of that, the, uh, of that art, mm. it, I'm sure it helped, but I, my joints themselves are flexible. Um, I, that, that's the, phys that's the only physical attribute I would say that, that benefits me. Um, yeah. you know, I don't, I don't have a lot of gym strength, if you will, my mm. bench press is not impressive. I feel like I, I have good natural strength, <clears throat> uh, my, my dad's always called it a certain type of strength that I won't say here on the podcast, but yeah, uh, I, my, my flexibility, absolutely. Um, you know, mentally I, I, I hate getting, I hate getting submitted. So, mm -hmm. um, you're either going to have to put me to sleep or pretty damn near yeah. put me to sleep or in a serious situation, like a competition, you're going to have to, you know, maim a joint for me to, for me to submit. Yeah, uh, which you bring up Mikey, Mikey Musumeshi. He he had a match this weekend where he was in the middle of breaking mechanics for an entire eight minutes on his opponent. Mm -hmm. The guy was he broken for eight minutes continuously and never never tapped. He he's now in a full cast. He'll probably never walk again. So oh, Jesus, you know it. Uh, it could also be a, a hindrance, if you will. But yeah, my flexibility, I would say. That happened, that happened once on an armbar uh, on myself. I wouldn't tap and you hear it. You hear it in the ear. It went pop, 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 pop. And I was like, fuck. And it was six months. I was out of commission. And no. uh, and looking back, it's definitely not worth it. But in the heat of the moment, I, I get it, man. I get it, especially when it's so good and you're in, you're in it and you've been in it for a while. You're like, I'm not going to be the first guy to stop. I'm not going to be the first guy to quit. So anyway, man. Uh, I'll, I'll move on from jujitsu in a second. Uh, I'll ask you one more question. Gordon Ryan, best of all time? Nogi grappler? Yeah. Nogi, yeah. Yeah. Sab. Pedro? No. I mean, who, who, uh, who, who's your gi? Padre Gracie. Padre Gracie is mm. the best overall um, jujitsu artist of all time. Okay. Why, why do you say that? It, it's f strong fundamentals? I mean, what, what are your thoughts? Well, the, the the guy's fundamentals are insane. Anybody at that level, right. anybody at, at a high level, high co competitive level black belt is going to have incredible fundamentals. But yeah, Hadra Gracie's the type of guy who will beat a world champion with moves that you expect to see in a white belt or a blue belt tournament. You know, he'll he'll on mark one of the best in the world from close guard. Yeah, that's not supposed to happen. But he's he's the most accomplished. He's um. He, he's the best. Now, Nogi, there's people who would argue guys like Marcelo Garcia are, are the- I was going to say, yeah. You know, Gordon Wright and John Danaher essentially rebranded Marcelo's system. Yeah. Uh, however, Marcelo never, never accomplished what, what Gordon's accomplished. Now, I don't, I don't enjoy this, the, the personality right. that comes with it. I think that's an unfortunate aspect of it all, but yeah, I'm, the guy just, uh, the guy's changed jujitsu for the better. He's brought awareness. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think we live in a world and he recognizes this. He, we live in a world where you have to be brat. You have to be crass. You have to be in people's faces. You know, I mean, Connor brought the UFC to the next level, you know, uh, Rhonda did the same way. They both had super high personality. Of course you have to win. And I think, you know, I think, uh, what Ryan is doing is making it somewhat as mainstream as it is today. I mean, how, who else do you know that is a multimillionaire from just strictly jujitsu, right? I mean, that, that, yeah, that's tough. But uh, I'm glad you mentioned uh, Marcel uh, Garcia because he's actually one of my all-time favorites. Just just the strangling ability, the the the, the dars and the rear naked and stuff. And the guy's built odd too. He's like small, but he looks like a power lifter with his legs. It's, it's crazy. Maybe that's why his base is so strong, right? And his base is so heavy. But um. Have you seen where he defeats Ricardo Ramirez, who is a, like an ultra heavyweight, probably outweighs him by over a hundred pounds? Pro probably. I went through about a year or two of 
just straight being a stan, being a, a groupie of Marcel Garcia. Dude, I YouTube like, every night. I'd be like hour or two just watching YouTube stuff of, of him. So I'm sure I, I'm sure I did. I'm the, sure the did. crazy part of what he did and why, like my professor, I, I he would rank him higher than Gordon Ryan uh, on this the scale of goats. Mm -hmm. He went to ADCC, which is the essentially the Olympics for jujitsu, and he he won it with mm. having trained no gi before he he started training no gi about a week or two before he went to adcc and he still won it so he had been training in a kimono and a gi for his entire career and a week yeah. or two before the olympics of of grappling he he started to train no gi and he went out and he won it in dominating fashion wow i didn't know that i didn't know that transition was that quick so that 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 goes to show you that he's a master of the fundamentals, right? For you to be able to transition that quickly. Exactly. My one of my coaches, Sarah McMahon, who is uh, an Olympic silver medalist, mm -hmm. uh, she is a, a brown belt under Marcelo Garcia. Mm -hmm. He's attached to, to the academy. That's very cool. So does Sarah still uh, still train uh, with you guys? Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. very cool. Yeah, yeah. I enjoy watching her fight. You know, very aggressive, wrestler silver medalist, right? Olympics. Yeah. Yeah, better she just accepted a contract with Bellator. Oh, nice. Yeah, incredible, incredible martial artist, incredible person. It's it's hilarious because my my yeah. instructor is her husband, and he's okay. an incredible black belt. However, she gets her brown belt from from Marcella for her black belt from Marcella. It's it's all about finding a community. Yeah, you know that's why that's why CrossFit gyms are so popular. You know, going in and working out by yourself, you're going in there with a group of people who have a similar goal and they hold you accountable and for me the jujitsu community is is filled with um anybody from you know multi-millionaire entrepreneurs to you know your next door neighbor stoner teenager and it's a it's a pretty incredible community um and it holds me accountable and you know it's where you find your friendships it's where you find support yeah and not just going in there working out or you know, increasing your heart rate. It's being a part of, you know, as cliche as it sounds, something bigger for yeah. just, not just yourself, but for others. And um, it's a lifelong journey. So you may be the student, you may be the teacher or somewhere in between. And, you know, that, that ranges from day one to day in infinity, you know, that, that it's always like an ebb and flow. So it's, uh, it's just about finding a group of people that, that help better you. You know, I'm a big believer in you surround yourself with people that improve you. You know, if you're hanging out with shit bags, then chances are you're going to be a shit bag yourself. Right. Right. Is that why you stopped hanging out with me? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I, I, I almost have a tear in my eye, Austin, because the teacher has now, I mean, the student has now become the teacher. So I'm, I'm happy to see the, the man he you've become. You inspired me, brother. And I, I don't say that lightly. I know we joke around and, and obviously we're trying to be on our best behavior on the podcast, but, um. We do talk a lot of shit to each other, but the reality is, uh, you know, there's a lot of love there. So I appreciate that. I appreciate you. I felt, I know, right? It's, tell you what, my glass is empty. It's the booze talking. <laughs> so I can't be held accountable for what I said. Uh, what's going on with the family? Any exciting news? You guys planning any vacations? Any uh, goals? Anything you guys want to share? Anything exciting? Um, you know, the wife and I both have have uh, careers that are important to us that we pour a lot into and yeah. and managing our careers with our passions outside of our careers with our children it's it's full time so just being as good of a dad as I, as I can be you know working as hard as i possibly can for number 3 you know what i mean really that's all life is at, at this point if if this is too personal you don't have to share it. or if you share it and then you look back you say uh i don't want uh, it aired i'll edit you you have full <laughs> edit uh, capability but no worry I'm, I'm i'm really close to your family close to you known you since you oh. were a kid um i'll say i know your dad you know he's a mentor of mine he's also a guy that gave me an opportunity in an industry and a career that i had no business being in and you know something that an adventure that was supposed to be four years is somehow turning into a 20 year <laughs> adventure and that's still going. So that's pretty cool. Um, he's, he's, your dad's a guy's guy, you know, he raised you a certain way. Uh, and also he's done a good job. Um, you have a son, you have a daughter, 
what are some of the things you take away? What are some of the things maybe you want to do different or, or if anything at all? Yeah, we can yeah. thoughts on that. But my, my I, I'm very, very blessed. I have both my parents in my life. They're together. I have a great relationship with all my siblings. They have a good relationship with each other. Mm -hmm. with my parents. It's a, it's a, it is a great dynamic. I'm incredibly blessed. Um, you know, both my parents live very different lives than I've lived. They, they both had, um, you know, very different traumatic experiences that I've never been privy to. Mm -hmm. And, you know, being raised by my parents, the one thing that was always apparent was that we were their priority and that's right. obvious to this day. And that extends to their grandchildren as well. Um, you know, being on this journey of self-awareness, I, I look at my childhood, uh, the way that I was raised and, um, obviously every parent makes mistakes. Sure. Um, so my, my goal is to improve on my, or, or like take my experiences and, and improve on them, uh, be, be as hard as it may be, be a better father than my, than my father was. And he's a mm. great father. Um, you know, I, I, I try to be very compassionate and sympathetic and big hearted. Um, you know, something like my, my, my dad's experiences, um, you know, I was, I, I created this mentality early on that, um, Hey, somebody wrongs you, you, you write them off. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's a very easy way to deal with, to deal with pain. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and so I've, I, I've kind of shifted and being being a type of person that could easily write somebody off or say hey you're you're out of my life forever for a simple infraction to try to be a lot more understanding and sympathetic and and having some perspective because hey, i've lived a, a fucking great life so it's really mm -hmm. easy for me to you know maybe be a certain way and um i have to understand or i've come to understand that people's lives are incredibly different than mine. Yeah. Their childhoods and their experiences can be radically different than what I experienced. And having an open heart and trying to truly understand who that person is at their core and why they are who they are, mm -hmm. um, that's a focus of mine. Um, so not, not saying that my parents necessarily easily write people off, but, um, you know, my, my old man specifically, um, he never taught me that, but I, that, that was something that I, I picked up on my, I identified it as a source of strength when yeah. in reality, um, I've come to learn that forgiveness is the, the ultimate symbol of strength, Yeah, uh, which it's a complete 180. But, um, I went to, to Cambodia basically with a, with a religious version of Dennis and doctors without borders when I was a junior in high school. And we met up with an individual whose family <clears throat> was murdered by the Khmer Rouge, the, the communist regime at the time and one of the worst genocides in human history. And, um, his entire message was forgiveness. We met him in this little village where wow. his family was interned and murdered. And I remember him taking us on a tour of the village and we walked to this little house in the, in the middle of this tiny little village. And he, this, this gentleman starts laughing and talking to this guy, um, in, in Cambodian. And he looks back at us and says, Hey, I want to introduce you to one of the people who murdered my family. Oh, wow. and, and my, my 16, 17 year old self was just dumbfounded. Yeah. This, this murderer was younger than the man himself. And it turns out he was a, like a nine year old little boy who <clears throat> the cop brainwashed into thinking that his own family was, was yeah. evil. That's the institution. And, um, they, they brainwashed this, this little guy into being able to, to murder people. Yeah. And, um, I remember looking at the interaction between these two men and thinking, man, I'll never have an excuse. I'll never have a reason to not forgive, um, you know, coming back full circle, yeah. being as, being as forgiving as possible and, and as open hearted as possible, which is still about, I'll, I'll admit, um, has become very important to me. Yeah. I, I think you and I are hardwired a certain way. And as I can really relate, I, I think the, the power of, of empathy is, it's probably one of the most powerful things that you can can harness and you can bestow on people. 
you know, being able to understand where they're coming from. Because, I mean, I'm 46. I learned this at 44 and a half. So it took me my whole life to learn this, is that most of the time, the shit that people do to you in that moment has nothing to do with you, right? It's a combination of everything that they've been through. And, you know, that guy that cuts you off, it's not about you. That guy that flipped you off or yelled you or you call customer service or something. This person's just having a horrible day. You can tell it's not about you. It's, it's our narcissistic tendencies to think that everything is about us. But most of the time, you're not that important. It's not about you. This person is dealing with God knows what, you know, and you just happen to be there in that moment. So I, I try to live life from that perspective. But, you know, obviously there, there are people that when you go, hey, there's a, there's a pattern, then this person needs to be cut out, out of my life. But for the most part, having empathy and, and second tries and even sometimes third tries are, are a gift. And I think it's, it's a great gift to give, man. So th that's, that's great. Um, do you, do you worry about society right now being a parent, you know, the trajectory of where we're going? I mean, not, uh, not to turn this political or anything like that, but more philosophical, uh, especially you being in California and stuff. Are you seeing certain things that you worry about? Oh yeah. Not to, not to promote another podcast, mm -hmm. but me too. Harlan's hardcore history. Is, oh yeah. I'm, Heck yeah. I'm a huge fan. Huge and, fan. Uh, two days ago, I just, for the, I think the third or fourth time finished uh, his series called The Death Throws the Republic. And it talks mm -hmm. about the Roman Republic, the rise of the, the Roman Empire. It's an incredible series. I mean, and I'll be the next one. Okay. Yeah, I I, I see so much. I, cor I, I relate so much to, you know, mm -hmm. what, I've, what I've studied and learned, you know, from the fall of the Roman Republic, if you will, to, to today's society. I, yeah. I think we're on the, I think we're on the, the back end of of uh, American civilization. I think we're on the downfall of it all. I, I think that we we were at the precipice, um, you know, a few decades ago, yeah. and we're 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 going down. You know, there's never been a civilization in human history that's lasted. Yeah. And you know, it's very arrogant as as Americans for us to think that that won't happen to us also. That's true because I guarantee you, every empire uh, throughout history felt the same way. It's not going to happen to us. Right. Of course. Yeah. And, and it's, I think what happens is it's, what's that old saying, you know, tough times create strong men, strong men create, you know, easy times, easy time, create soft men, soft men create, you know, hard times. And then you just mm -hmm. been to repeat. And, um, we as a society have been soft for a long time, but I think we're reaching the peak of it, you know, and it's a weird. And, you know, I, can, I, I, I come from a perspective of an immigrant, first generation immigrant, man. I always tell people all the time, you know, uh, America has a lot of problems, you know, politically has a lot of problems, especially right now because it's so divisive, divisive or divisive. I can never say that word. Divisive. Yeah. Yeah. It's, all, it's so divisive, right? Everything you do and it's on purpose at this point, you know, it's on purpose. Media does it, what have you. And the people in power, people in politics, they don't care. At the end of the day, they yell and scream on camera and they do handshake deals behind closed doors underneath the table kind of deal and everyone benefits and everyone becomes wealthy and we the people that are arguing with each other at the dinner table are the ones that you know make out last to get the short end of the stick and that's remnants of every empire that you see you know when, when the belly gets too fat and life gets too easy that's when the downturn begins um the ideal of america for me as an immigrant i still believe in I think the policies of America and, and the politics of America is destroying America. Even at, at our worst, we can still be a beacon for hope for the rest of the world. You know, I think we can, I think, and I believe we can still hang on to that. I would hope, but, uh, but definitely society rules of engagement in society has changed so much, man, you know, and I don't know who's behind it. I don't know what the purpose of it is, but I don't know. So what do you think? when you raise your son, your daughter, like, have you Morgan talked about, talked about that? Yeah. Uh, you know, ignorance is bliss. So putting my head in the sand a little bit and not trying to worry about just anything and everything that may happen to my Mark? family, um, Mark. is like, you know, nine, they say what 97% of what you worry about never comes to fruition. So right. I'm, I, I'm, I'm not, I, I try not to get worried or upset about societal trends or mm -hmm. what I'm in my community. And I try to focus more on just raising my family right, teaching them morals and values, you know, the idea of working hard and respecting others and, and standing up for yourself, but 
being big hearted while you do so. Yep. Uh, that's much more important to me than just worrying about, you know, what, what sort of world my children and grandchildren will live in because I, I, I have a very, I'll have very little impact on, on the world at large. Yeah. You know, the impact that I can make is within my own family and within my, my small circle. So that's what I try to focus on and not the, the impending doom, if you will. Yeah. Uh, but, but man, especially being in California, you know, there's, there's trends here that you, yeah. that you see that are very, very concerning to me. And, you know, for, for society as a whole, that the quote you said was what was running through my mind when you were saying it. Mm. And, you know, when you, things are just so damn easy and people have, uh, it's like, man, in the, in the scheme of things, this is what you're worried about. This is what you're focusing on. Yeah. You know, you know, being a part of a, going back to like the combat sport thing, um, I think it's important to be physically, mentally tough and, um, it's okay if you're not, but the, the idea of just embracing, um, softness, yeah. it's, it's something that I think is dangerous. Yeah. Not, not winning a fight. And I'm talking metaphorically, not winning a fight is nothing to be ashamed of, right? Not willing to fight is totally different. You know, yeah. so I think the idea and the, and the belief of gotta, you gotta have something to believe in. You gotta stand your ground and you gotta be willing to, to fight for it, um, is super important. And I think what happens as of late, you know, unfortunately for me, like I said, you know, from an immigrant's perspective, it's also a lack of appreciation. I heard this saying a long time ago and it really stuck with me. You know, people that are born in this country, in the United States of America, people that are born in this country are trust fund babies of freedom. And they just have no clue because they've been handed freedom since they breathe their first breath, right? And they don't have anything to compare it to. It's, it's crazy to me that in college campuses, there are people that are marching and wanting communism to roll into the United States. And they have no clue. You were just talking about the Khmer Rouge. She's like, you have no clue. I come from a war-torn Vietnam. And it's just this weird, this weird desire in human nature to go when it, when it's too easy, you look for something to battle. And I think a lot of these kids and a lot of the society has been so easy that they look for imaginary enemies, you know? And, and disclaimer, man, I, I know there's a lot of wrong that we have to write, you know, there's a lot of stuff, injustice in, in our society, you know, in, in certain communities and stuff like that. But as a whole, we're living in probably the most prosperous full of opportunity that I think in history, period, you know, but we just don't see it, or at least, you know, most of us don't see it. But anyway, yeah, when, when there's not, when there's not a real fight to fight, yeah, people fight to fight. We in Western culture are forcing our, are putting ourselves in uncomfortable situations yeah. that are also very easy to pull ourselves out of. You know, you sit into an ice bath for a minute and it's mm. terrible, horrible, but it's really easy to stand up about out of the ice bath and continue on with your blessed day. You know, most of the world doesn't have the same, the same luxuries. Yeah. But most of the world, it's 24 seven ice bath. Right. And, um, I don't know if you did, you know, on purpose or not. You're talking smack about ice baths, bro. I'm a, I'm a ice cold plunger, man. What's wrong with you? No, but I, you know, I do know. I, and that's probably why actually I do it. You're right, Austin. It, it helps me stay grounded because my life is fucking soft. I live in a beautiful house. I got a beautiful wife. You know, my dog is snoring on, I don't know. I think her, her bed is like 300 bucks. A fucking dog has a $300, $300 bed, which I'm ashamed to say, by the way. And she's snoring across in the hallway. And that's my life. That's my America that I've built for myself. Right. So you're right. I, I do, I do chase it. And I, I think that's why we do chase it. But yeah, to your point, man, it's, we find the discomfort to kind of just set our, ourself in a little bit of reality check, but it's, you're right. It's not true discomfort. You know, you're talking about discomfort. There are people in the world that is, that is 24, seven, 365. That is their life. I mean, talk to someone in the Congo, talk to someone that is in in some indigenous tribe that are still having tribal wars, you know, and warlords and stuff. And that's the surrounding. I mean, life gets real, real quick. You know, we're, we're, most of our stuff is make believe here, man. So I actually do, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, I, well, was, I, was, hey, I was, hey, on ice baths. I do a yeah. ton of, and then I, I go outside and I hose myself off in the, 
you know, the cold water for, for 30 seconds or as much as I could stand it. So I'm right there with you. But. No, man, I, I, I do it. So I acknowledge why I do it. You're right. You're a thousand percent right. That's why I admit it. And, and I know you were talking shit. You were just, you were just being realistic. And, um, and one of these days when you come here, we'll do one together. Maybe, maybe not together, but we'll see. Uh, before I let you go, brother, I want to ask you a couple of things in terms of um, your personal goals. Um, you don't have to elaborate too much, but what are some of the things that you foresee for yourself just in general? Where would you like to be in life? Because you're still, how old are you now? 31. 31. You're, you're, okay. you're a baby. When you're an old fart like me at 46 with bad knees and a bad back, how would you like your every day to be for the at, most part? At what age was it? I'm sorry. My At my age, 46. But it's a long ways away. It's hard to, it's you hard to go back. Bitch. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I love to live a good life. I love to travel and, you know, eat good food and whatever mm -hmm. it may be. There, there's no way I won't be, won't be working and applying myself at that age. Right. Uh, you know, my, my wife and I are high school sweethearts. We've been together almost 15 years and my, I, I grew up with my dad, you know, uh, with his daily three by five cards with his you know uh his goals listed out the dream boards whatever it may be so mm -hmm. i i have had specific goals since i you know was 17 years old with my then girlfriend now wife about you know what we wanted to achieve and uh we, we always said net worth of a million dollars by the time we're 35 years old um that's the that's the largest overall financial professional goal that i i've held on to since i was in my teenage years and uh, but overall being a good dad that's my that's going to be my marker uh, of success in life mm -hmm. I, I know a lot of hyper successful people that are honestly mediocre fit parents oh, yeah. and when you're on your deathbed and you have uh you have your children around you that you made into great wonderful people or mm -hmm. or helped mold you know help you know, help uh, guide them down that path of, of prosperity, both, yeah. you know, uh, mentally and physically, spiritually, whatever. Um, that's going to be my, my, my sign of success. When I look up at yeah. looking at my, my family who are good people who, um, hopefully I raised right. That's, that's my, my meter of success. Um, you, you've inspired me. So I, I've, I've wanted to get into real estate investment, uh, for, for years and, I, I'm hoping that in the next few years that, uh, you know, the, the years of hoarding cash will pay off and, mm -hmm. you know, it'll be the right time for some, for some real estate investments also. I will, right, we'll, we'll talk. You don't have to hoard cash to do it. We'll talk. <laughs> we'll talk offline. Um, what your parents have gone through, what they become, what they achieve. Are you proud of them? Incredibly, incredibly. They're my, they're my best friends. Like I love my parents. So much they're mm -hmm. incredible human beings incredible grandparents mm -hmm. they 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 set the example of serving you know or, or living for your children now i'm not saying they live exclusively for their kids they they have you know great individual lives but they, they make it apparent that their kids are their priorities and it that's incredibly important to me too yeah um, i decided to to have kids it wasn't an accident and even if it was that's a you know something that i that's a bet that I made for myself. And, um, I have a responsibility not only to my, my kids, but to the world at large to, to be there for them and to be as good of a dad as I can be. And I asked that question and asked you if you were proud of them already knowing the answer, because that was a, a dumb question. Of course, you're proud of them, uh, of what they've done, the people they've become in the process, the kids they raise. But the reason why I bring that up, because I want to piggyback what you were saying earlier is that having your kid genuinely tell you or tell the world, mom and dad, I am proud of the things that you've been through and the person you've become and the things that you've done for us. Bill Gates can't buy that. I don't care how much money you have. You cannot buy that. You, you, for your kids to have a true love for you and true, you know, appreciation for the things you've done and the, the people you become, you have to go through the fire, man. And you have to do the right things more times than not. Like you said, no one's perfect. So, you know, to your, to your statement earlier, you know, you keep going on this trajectory, my friend, I have no doubt that Dax and Ryan will say those words to you and Morgan at some point as well too. So, 
Um, I'll say in advance, I'm very proud of you. Um, Wait. Before I let you go then, I want you to leave us with uh, a message. Um, stand on your soapbox. Leave us a, a message, something positive, something, uh, I don't know, philosophical. Or how about this? Uh, no crying on camera. Actually, you cry. It'll give me more rating. But you ha if you had an opportunity right now to bestow maybe one or two lessons that no matter what, these are the two lessons, three lessons that you have to bestow to Dax and Ryan, what would it be? Um, hmm. Well, I, I think one of the most important qualities that my dad instilled in me was perseverance and believing in yourself and convincing yourself that if you have an end goal in mind and you commit yourself to achieving that goal, that, that you really can achieve that. Mm. You know, he, he never, he never told me I was, I'm going to be an NFL superstar or something like that. But he let me know that if you, if you have a goal and you apply yourself, you will achieve that goal if you truly apply yourself. And I believe that. And my, my, other than being, you know, big hearted, sympathetic human beings, I want my children to know that they can achieve anything that they set their mind to. I know that, I know that may sound cliche. Um, and obviously there are limits to what we can all achieve, mm. but I want kids to have that, that burning desire to, to chase and to realize their, their dreams and goals, whatever those may be. Um, I want, I want them to be unique to them, obviously. And I want them to just be good people and fulfilled and good, you know, benefiting members of society, you know, contributing members of society. Um, so persevere. Don't, don't ever stop. If you have a, if you have a goal and a dream, go through hell and high water to, to achieve it and fight for it. Love it. Love it. Well, thank you, my friend. It's past my bedtime. I told you I wouldn't gonna, wasn't gonna hold you too long. I thank you very much for your time, dude. It's good catching up. Yeah, this was, this was a treat. It's my first, my first, uh, podcast. So, um, you know, I appreciate it. It's only downhill from here. Same thing I told Forrest Griffin. I was, I was talking to him when, when he was gracious enough to give me some time. I said, man, you're a world champion. You're a legend. You're a hall of famer. You know, you've made money, you're famous. And now you get to be on my podcast and must be uh, the, <laughs> the highlight of your career, man. So it's only downhill from here, brother. <laughs> well, thank you very much. This was, uh, this was fun and exciting and you are, you're a very, very important person to me. And I know that you didn't have me on to, you know, pay you compliments or, you know, homage or anything like that, but you're a, you're a wonderful human being, my friend. And, um, the, the thing I can say about you is that, uh, you're, you're, you're always a positive light in the room. Thank you, man. It means a lot. Cause there are days when I don't want to be. So, uh, Mr. Austin, love you, brother. Go uh, kiss the family and uh, give Morgan a hug for me. And I will talk to you guys later. Take care, man. Hey, you have a good night, my friend. Take care.